Good morning, this is Bishop John with a homily from Friar Doc for the seventh Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Old Testament reading this morning is taken from the first book of Samuel in chapter 26, verses 2 and then 7 and 9, 12 and 13, and 12, 22 and 23. The responsorial verses are from Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2, 3 and 4, 8 and 10, and 12 and 13. And the, uh, the epistle is taken from the first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 45 through 49. And the reading for, for the gospel this morning is from the gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 27 through 38. I'll discuss all of these here, but as always, I urge you to read them uh, in your spare time. And make some time to read them, they're important. Uh, for the seventh Sunday in ordinary time, the reality of how much our Father in Heaven gives to us when we fear Him, when we love Him, say so, and behave like we actually believe what we say, is driven home in the lessons repeatedly. How do we behave like we are the sons and daughters of the living God? Just in case we're confused, the lessons today all give us examples. The reading from chapter 26 of the first book of Samuel, written in the 11th century BC, uh, starts off with Saul, the anointed king of Israel, becoming exposed to the forces, quote unquote, of David, whom he had been intent on killing. More importantly, we see David being presented with a fortuitous opportunity to kill the king, but refusing to take advantage of the situation. Uh, David and Abishai sneaked into the royal encampment in the middle of 3,000 crack troops where everyone was sleeping. They got right up to the king himself, also fast asleep. Verse 7. Abishai understood that God had delivered the king into their grasp this day, quote unquote, and proposed David give him the order to, quote, nail him to the ground with one thrust of a spear, end quote. Verse 8. Oh boy, they had the king in their grasp. It was time to end it. They were both remarkably good warriors, and Abishai's response to their good fortune is entirely understandable. David confounded and disappointed him, however, by refusing to lay hands on the Lord's anointed. Verse 9. He resisted the urge because his own role as a servant of God meant he couldn't kill the king no matter how much he'd have liked to finish it in the obvious way. We can almost hear Abishai muttering to himself as they worked their way back out of Saul's encampment. I think most of us can appreciate Abishai's dismay. I, I certainly can. But David's way is a still more excellent way, as our beloved tent maker Paul might say. Despite King Saul being a man who needed killing, as the old saying goes, he was the Lord's anointed king, and killing him, although it would be getting rid of an obvious problem for David, would also be a crime against God. David here is wise enough and trusting enough to understand the solution lies with God and not with him. David instead took the water jug Saul needed to survive, symbolically I mean, and the spear he needed for his military power and got out of the camp, quote, without anyone's knowing because the Lord had put them into a deep slumber, end quote, verse 12. With God's help, David removed the royal necessities, so to speak, but spared the king's life. From Quote, a remote hilltop at a great distance from the troops, end quote, in verse 13, David called out to them, Here is the king's spear. Let an attendant come over and get it. Verse 22, the king had no honor left, but David did, and he pointed it out to the whole army. Today, though the Lord delivered you into my grasp, 
I would not harm the, the Lord's anointed. Verse 23. <clears throat> from, from the Almighty's point of view, Saul was blessed with another perfect opportunity to repent. But as we know, it wasn't going to happen. Unlike David, Saul didn't believe like he believed, uh, didn't, didn't behave like he believed that God was all that powerful or that he was paying any attention. God hadn't changed. Saul had changed. By his own actions and his own choices, in a way growing more and more insane over the years, he had separated himself more and more from God over the years. In some sense, each of us, as we're strutting our hour upon the stage, as Shakespeare might say, gets to choose how the play will end. So, why is it so many of us wander down the same path as Saul instead of stepping smartly along, along the one David shows us here? Nobody's perfect, of course, but some of us are dull as rocks. The verses from Psalm 103, also written in the 11th century BC, put the lie to the notion that the God of the Old Testament was full of inflexible wrath and uncompromising vengeance. The responsorial verse gets, sets the tone here. Our Abba is kind and merciful and he doesn't have a hair triggered uh, temper in verse 8. He doesn't deal with us according to our sins or requite us according to our crimes, verse 10. He certainly is just, but his justice is everywhere tempered with his mercy. The whole focus here is on how merciful he is and how beneficial it is for us to bless his holy name, verse 1, and to receive, therefore, all his benefits, verse 2. He pardons our sins and heals our ills, verse 3. He saves us from destruction and even crowns us with kindness and compassion, verse 4. When he saves us from his own rigorous justice, putting our sins away from us, as far as the east is to the, from the west, as it says in verse 12, he does so because he is our Abba and he has compassion on his children, verse 13. He wants us to turn to him with love, to trust him and to be faithful to him. He wants us to love him with everything we are, that is, with all our hearts, our minds and our strength, as it is written in the famous Shema, Deuteronomy 6.5. Will we followers of the way screw up even with the triumph of Jesus Christ and our calling on his name? Yes. We are still the children of Adam despite putting on the new clothes given to us by our Messiah. Will our egos get in the way so that we don't hear our Abba still small voice or see his finger moving in the world around us? Yes. We still haven't given up the urge to hide in shame from his glory and to turn our faces from him. Will we ignore the gentle tugs of the Holy Spirit or forget the kindness and compassion with which the Father has crowned us? Yes. Once again, we are still the children of Adam and we all too often substitute fear for love when we confront those around us, much less our Father in heaven. Our Lord didn't do any of these things, but we have and we will. The only hope for us is to remember that our Abba's kindness and mercy are still there for us when, when the dust settles. I would argue here that at least one consequence of lives lived faithfully would, would be a tendency over the years to stir up less and less dust in the first place. Uh, this, in any case, is my hope and my prayer. In the selection from chapter 15 of his first epistle to the Corinthians, Paul contrasts the natural parts of us with our spiritual parts. We began with the natural parts, but now we also have the spiritual parts because of our faith in Jesus Christ. The two parts are derived from different sources. The natural man, Adam, came first, and then the spiritual man, Jesus Christ, verse 46. Just as Adam became a living being, citing uh, Genesis 2-7, uh, so the last Adam became a life-giving spirit, in verse 4, 45. 
Those who follow the first man's example, turning away from God, are also earthly. And those who follow the heavenly one, the followers of Jesus, are also heavenly. Verses 47 48. Adam is the first one of us, the very first human being, not the first Homo sapiens body moving with a nephesh spirit like the animals, but the first one also possessing a neshama put into him or breathed into him by the ruach or spirit of Elohim, the mighty creator of the universe. He was thus <clears throat> the progenitor of all mankind and not just of the Hebrews. He was created from the earth and uh, ruddy at least or reddish let's say which is Adama in Hebrew uh, the word play uh, in the original language is obvious, and Paul at least had it in mind here, don't you know? Jesus Christ, on the other hand, came down from heaven and returned thence after the ascension. Paul maintains we followers of the way have borne the image of the earthly one, but now tread a different path, following our master and trusting our lives to God, so we shall also bear the image of the heavenly one. Verse 49. We are adopted, certainly, but we are heirs through Jesus Christ of the kingdom of heaven. That is, we shall finally, fully become the sons and daughters of our Abba. We are still created from the dust of the earth, as it were, but now with the bright stars of God's divine love for us, dancing before our eyes and lighting up our hearts. How can we not delight in this incredible gospel, this unbelievable good news? and share it with as many as we can. Jesus tells us in the verses from chapter 6 of the Gospel of Luke how and with whom we should share our property and to whom we should extend our love and express our kindness. To those of us who think in terms of my stuff, my time, and my life, they are difficult commandments. Jesus tells us they are instead all gifts from our Abba and not ours. For those of us buried in the competition and strife of the world, these verses contain strange instructions indeed. I'm supposed to love my enemies and do good to those who hate me, verse 27. I'm supposed to bless those who curse me and pray for those who mistreat me, verse 28. I'm supposed to open myself up to one who imposes on me, verse 29. I'm supposed to share what I have, not just with the one who needs it, but also with the one who steals it? Verse 30. Really? This is hard stuff. <clears throat> Maintaining a civil tongue in my head <clears throat> is easy when I'm interacting with civil people, but it ain't so easy when I'm dealing with an insensitive clod who thinks such behavior is a waste of time. And it's even worse with an ignorant, arrogant buffoon who thinks I'm a servant and should act like it. I know my master is asking me to go the extra mile here, but it sure seems like it's a lot further than just a mile. Despite all the years of reflections, meditations, and prayers, for instance, I still don't handle conflict, or especially bullies, very well. And people who like manipulating other people still make my blood boil. Even in this small way, I'm not following much of the commandments, am I? Right in the middle of the verses is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, verse 31. Our Lord's listeners had long been familiar with the silver rule. That is, don't do to others what you don't want done to you. But these new words kind of turn things around. Rather than refraining from acting, we're called to act. Do we know what we would like, others would like? We don't, actually. So to be safe, we may tiptoe around a little to figure out, uh, figure things out before jumping in with both feet. In any case, we should surround all this with prayer and trust Jesus to help us out. It's funny how insights for the right thing to do can pop into your head while you're praying now, isn't it? 
This is really about listening quietly to Jesus and opening our hearts to our Abba's love and compassion. The consequence in our lives has to be the passing, uh, uh, passing the love we receive from him on to those around us. Everything we have is from God. Even the yearning that pulls us toward him comes from the grace he has put in us. Whatever we share in this world with others isn't ours to begin with. Now, is it? As my friend Alan uh, would comment, I'm just saying. If we only take care of our friends and loved ones, how is that any different than what most people do around the world? Verses 32, 33, and 34. It isn't different at all. It isn't karma that has blessed us with whatever health, wealth, and happiness we have. It is our Abba who has done that. The same way we know we can turn to Him for mercy and kindness, just so should those around us know they can turn to us for mercy and kindness. All we're doing here is reflecting our Abba's love for us to those around us, precisely as He would. Verse 36. We should also uh, get out of the condemnation business and leave that for God uh, because what goes around comes around. Uh, verse 37 uh, liberally translated. This is how it is. Not always easy and certainly disappointing to my sophomoric sense of justice, justice and retribution. But there you go. As followers of the way Turning to our Abba, trusting him, and acting like we, uh, we love him means seeing Jesus Christ in the faces of those around us and responding with love, compassion, kindness, and mercy, even when someone's being a jerk. If we see each other as vessels of God's presence, we can develop a perspective with a kind of affection and regard that makes following the golden rule more of a possibility for us. In verse 35. If we fully commit to this kind of life, overflowing gifts from God are ours in return. Verse 38. How else should we describe being in the lap of our Abba? These words of Jesus are really the culmination of all the other lessons today in that our love for and trust in the Lord should be reflected in a way that is different from the behavior of those uh, who don't have the same relationship with God. This doesn't mean we become impractical and irresponsible, dancing and chattering our way th through life without any tears or cares. We all are called to take up our crosses and follow our Lord, Matthew 16, 24. But it is a road we've chosen to take with quiet joy, noisy elation, and everything in between because eternal salvation is at the end of it. God bless you and yours.